serious deforestation event has occurred here in California, and that uh, the forests are continuing to be hammered by industrial extraction. Um, and we really think that if California wants to do something around global forests and climate change, that California needs to start here at home. So that's kind of that's kind of the focus of what I I'd like to speak of a little bit. And part of why I want to do this is I'm also going to be sharing information. I'd like that everyone uh, who's here perhaps they're aware of the fact that tomorrow there's a meeting of what's called the Governor's Climate and Forest Task Force. And this is an entity that I've studied deeply. Uh, and one of the things that has been really frustrating with the Governor's Climate and Forest Task Force, for instance, if you go to their website, you can immediately find information about other um, tropical subnational jurisdictions, for instance, about the rates of def deforestation or carbon density on the landscape, there's no information about California there. Okay, so again, these double standards to us are, are very serious. And the other fact that the governor, Governor Brown, through these efforts has basically endeavored to lead the state of California into the international climate policy arena, which he's doing with this. But California as a state does not have a state department. It doesn't have a ministry of foreign relations. There's no legislative oversight around California's engagement in international affairs. And again, we, we believe that that is a sign that California needs to hands off the tropical forests uh, unless we start addressing the, uh, the really extreme consumption of products coming from tropical forest areas. Uh, California, how many folks here are really familiar with the amount of crude oil that comes from the Amazon and into California's refinery sector? One in every 10 barrels of oil that is refined in refineries of California is coming from the Western Amazon. So these are these are the questions, uh, and, and then Jeff is working really hard on the palm oil stuff. So we were hoping to have a panel that would go deeper in, into the into the palm oil. So I've actually already gone ahead and done the entire presentation. <laughs> now I've got, I've got some more uh, nitty gritty because what I with so tomorrow's meeting of the Governor's Climate and Forest Task Force, of course, uh, you know, um, we're we're asking leaders to protect communities, not corporations. And, and the entire approach that California is promoting to, to forests within the context of carbon markets is designed to protect the polluter. And it puts at risk communities and the forest itself. Uh, so I'd like to give people some information here today, even though my presentation won't address tropical forests specifically, but that will help people feel really confident when or if, when, you decide to join the action tomorrow morning in front of the Governor's Climate and Forest Task Force uh, at um, 55 uh, Cyril Magnin at the downtown. You, you can find the information on you know, any of the announcements. This is going to be a really uh, key moment. And again, holding the state accountable. So I guess I'm probably just going to go ahead um, and get started here. The, what, the other thing I wanted to say though then is one thing, I'll be talking a little bit about forest offsets. I'd like to talk about California's cap and trade program a little bit. And I'll talk about the way there's a protocol, they call it the United States Domestic Forest Protocol. I'm going to look into that a little bit. Uh, I might make some uh, allusions to the California Red, which is California's uh, tropical forest thing, the California uh, reduced emissions from deforestation and forest degradation. But uh, I will not actually go deep on that topic, uh, even though it is something that I've worked on extensively here in the state of California in my presentation. I wasn't really prepared to do so. Um, nevertheless, on Tuesday especially, so there's so much great stuff happening at the Soil Not Oil conference. I'm sure you've already you know, been witness to some really you know, stimulating discussion. There's more stuff going on today. But in particular, uh, in, in regards to how to take the forest stuff a little bit deeper, uh, within the opportunities of the conference. On, on Tuesday morning, uh, there is uh, actually a plenary session that will, will be at, at the main uh, gray area. That's, uh, it, it's called Playing Nice with Big Oil, California Cap and Trade, Fracking, Offsets, and Red. So uh, the folks who are on that panel are, are really, really knowledgeable. So that would be a great opportunity to go deeper on this, um, the Mari Rose Taruk, who's from, uh, she has been the co-chair of the official, like illegally mandated 
Environmental Justice Advisory Committee of the Air Resources Board. She's there. And for folks to know that the Environmental Justice Advisory Committee has been rolled out regularly by the state of California to say that all of their climate policy is being vetted by the EJ community. But what they don't say is that on repeated occasions, the recommendations of this committee are simply round filed. For instance, this, this committee has recommended strongly against California pursuing cap and trade program, but it just got round filed, obviously, same with the red. So um, the other thing that's happening then that day uh, is there's another uh, panel and a breakout session in the afternoon um, on carbon pricing, a critical perspective for community resistance. So there'll be a lot of discussion about market mechanisms and in particular the, the question of red and whether it's appropriate or not for that kind of scheme to be coming into California climate policy. So I've got only like 15 slides then and what I'll try to do is use the slides to touch upon uh, more information than what I've shared with you already. Uh, so though that if we, you know, I might repeat things a little bit just to get some points through. And then ostensibly when I finish with these slides, we could have an open conversation that isn't really just a Q&A, but that has everyone involved. So um, global forest and climate change, my whole thing is, is California's forest or global forest too. Um, we, need, we need to recognize that. And then I wanted to start then by paying tribute to one of the great environmental defenders uh, California, Judy Berry, uh, who was uh, very involved in protecting the ancient redwood temperate rainforest ecosystem. Uh, Judy and her friend and, and colleague, former partner, you know, intimate uh, other music partner, Daryl Cherney, they were both um, subject to a violent attack in Oakland in May 1990, and their car was bombed. And they later, 10 years later, 12 years later, uh, won a lawsuit in which the FBI was required to give Daryl and Judy's estate uh, $4.4 million for their violation of their civil rights and the way the bombing was handled. So, um, California's forests are globally important. California's forests have been host over the decades to, uh, you know, major social movements to protect an uh, invaluable ecosystem and uh, the state and economic interests uh, who, you know, are invested in exploiting that resource have, have responded with extreme means. Uh, the other thing is to recognize that 20 years ago this month, a young activist named David Gypsy Chain was, was killed up in a protest in the Redwoods on, on a Pacific Lumber Company land. So, um, you know, the, the situation with the forest in California has changed a lot, but we have to remember what has happened in order to move forward appropriately. So, um, so protecting forests remains a global imperative. This is an old photo. This is from those days when the ancient redwoods were being subject to, to massive clear cutting. Um, what we know is that globally, it's about 35% of the original ancient old growth frontier forest that's left. But to know then, and this is what everyone should be holding California accountable for, is that in California, only 3% of the original old growth forest is left. It's not like all in one, you know, intact, uh, you know, uh, block. Right now, it's disparate segments spread out uh, throughout mostly the northern part of the state. Um, and in the Sierra, and of course, parks uh, like uh, Sequoia National Park, uh, Yosemite National Park, they, there's, you know, there's still really important old forest. A lot of California's wilderness suffers from the, the rocks and ice, kind of, so it's old forest, but a lot of the most important, really productive, vibrant, old growth forest was on private land, and it was ravaged. And the state of California not only green-lighted the permitting, they sent law enforcement to uh, extract people from you know, the trees, put pepper spray in their eyes, uh, there was a, a you know a tremendous effort of the state to essentially uh, 
delegitimize and marginalize those elements of communities here in California and across the country that, that had come together to protect the, this ancient forest that was at risk. So the state of California is responsible for a major deforestation act. And um, we, we need to remember that when you hear everything that's happening this week. And I'll come back a little bit more to what's going on. So when we talk about then forests and climate change, though, why it's so important to protect old forests, uh, even though increasingly we think that there's a lot of uh, validity in the idea that water quality and biodiversity uh, those are actually better metrics for determining like the climate resiliency of a forest. Uh, those of us who have some experience with old forests know that like, it's, it's this idea of having forests, it's been forests since time immemorial, and it's the idea of permanence, that the forest has been here for a long time. And there can be disturbance and there can be some changes, but the forest has been here for a really long time. Um, so you have to really remember that then, because what we want to think about is, is the way forest conservation is being used in climate policy to promote business as usual. Okay, so we want to keep coming back to this idea of permanence. Um, so the indispensable climate benefit from protecting old forests is for the protection of the stable stock. It's that old growth stock. And one thing that we have to remember is that old, old forests actually don't suck that much more extra carbon down out of the sky. They are filtering and all, but when you get to a steady state old forest, you've pretty much maxed out on carbon. That's where it is. Boom. Okay? Um, but it takes millennia to get there. Literally, millennia. It's not something that just happens. And there's the reference I was making that 35% of the world's forest is left. Uh, but again, California is, is way behind on that. Fully exceeded, you know, if that was a standard, uh, with only 3% of the old forest left in the state. Um, so we have to understand global carbon cycles. It's really imperative that we understand how humans are disrupting global carbon cycles if we're going to design effective solutions and uh, with that effective policy. So you have to look at how um, natural processes involve flows of carbon between the atmosphere, land, and oceans. Okay? There's four places that carbon can really be stored in the biosphere. We've got the land sector, we've got the atmosphere, we've got the ocean. There's lots of cycling, lots of cycling. I mean, California's forests, another thing that I'll, I'll speak about here is they're fire evolved. Okay, so forests are not like these static repositories of carbon. Forests are inherently volatile. In California especially, volatility is a part of how the forest is adapted. So it's thinking that we can just start locking carbon away in the forest. And oh yeah, hey, that's just like, is missing the fact that that fourth place where carbon can be stored is, is this place that we call geocarbon. This is the fossilized carbon that humans exploit as fossil fuels. And it has to be understand that when we mobilize that fossilized, that fossilized carbon, it's a one-way injection into the atmosphere. So one of the greatest myths of all this discussion about climate is to suggest in any way that the land sector can make up for the burning of fossil fuels. I'm going to get into that a little bit more. But that's really why we have to understand time scales. So fossil fuel carbon, the geocarbon, has been locked away for literally millions of years. Okay? Land sector, we got old forests, they can be there for a long time, but it's still very volatile, there's a lot of change. Okay, that's, it's fundamental climate science. So when we talk about carbon sequestration then in the land sector and in forests, you have to talk about it in the context of past deforestation and past land use change. If anyone talks about carbon sequestration in the forest, and this is where California is really, really um, trying to promote a certain sort of amnesia of the landscape, because the state of California refuses to come to grips with the fact that there was a massive deforestation event here, and that what we're really dealing with are severely carbon depleted landscapes. Okay, and the carbon density continues to plummet here. So, the forest protection and restoration can't offset the fossil fuel emissions. Okay, so the fossil fuel emissions, it literally takes, I mean, we're talking millions of years to pull that stuff back down again. And any sort of process whereby that uh, carbon is as stable as it has been for millions of years. Okay, so anyone who talks about carbon sequestration in forests has to be in the context of past land use change 
or deforestation. So again, understanding carbon cycles and the difference between biocarbon and geocarbon is essential for developing effective climate policy. And you know, if, if people aren't grokking this, then they're, they're really missing some of the, the basics that climate scientists have, have been, been trying to convey. And this is, this is where, when people talk about keeping it in the ground, it's, it's a fact. Okay, we, we have to stop mobilizing. And this is where the fossil fuel industry has gotten away with so much stuff because there's this great focus on the end of the tailpipe or the end of the smokestack, thinking that that's when the carbon got mobilized. But the real truth is, as soon as you pop a hole in the ground and start to pull that stuff out, you've mobilized it. And they know that. And they've tried to distract from the point of extraction. So the Permian Basin, for instance, in West Texas, you know, if we even wanted to stop taking fossil fuels out of that right now, we wouldn't be able to. They've started to frack it so hard and, and, and mess with it so hard to pull petroleum and gas out of there that it's, it's uncontrollable. That's why they don't, there's not enough infrastructure to capture all the gas. They're just burning it off. And if they said, we want to stop taking oil and gas out of the Permian, they wouldn't be able, you can't just cap it. So, um, we have to be really clear about how important it is to look at climate damage at the point of extraction, whether it be cutting a tree or pulling out petroleum, and our strategies have, have to respond to that. So the problem with forest offsets, then, is that there are very physical limits to the amount of carbon that can be sequestered by ecosystems like forests. It's, it's not an infinite amount, neither soil nor forest, so um, all an ecosystem is trying to do is make up for the past climate damage. Okay, so soils that are depleted, when they're trying to pull carbon back down in and rebuild the, the, the carbon in that soil, all they're trying to do is make up for the depletion, the previous depletion of that soil. There's nothing they can do to make up for fossil fuel emissions, okay? So I've already said this about the context of past deforestation, the harvested wood products. So this is a big thing to understand in California, and it's something that the UN does through FAO, um, is this idea, and I'll get into this a little bit more, about considering a harvested wood product as being sequestered carbon. Okay? But it's nothing but a delayed emission. Okay? It's, it's no longer forest carbon. And anyone who has walked by a construction site knows that we've known for decades working on forest issues that a phenomenally unfortunate amount of material ends up in the landfill. So those, it's just going to be committed eventually. And if we really want to mitigate climate change, we really want to reduce the amount of uh, you know, concentrations of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, it has to be stored permanently. So that comes back to why old forests are so important. Okay, old forests are so important because we've got to do everything we can to save them because that's a, as permanent as the land sector can get. Old, old ecosystems, old wild ecosystems, it's a far less amount of carbon, but for instance, car, uh, the, you know, the soils and desert ecosystems are, are remarkable for what they hold, but they need to be uh, you know, conserved. Uh, the word can come with a lot of baggage, but. Um, as much permanence as possible. And then this is what I want to get into about the truth about greenhouse gas emissions from the forest. Again. So California is participating in the Governor's Climate and Forest Task Force. Um, California still provides no data on the emissions from silviculture operations in the state, from logging. So California has the ability to, and they've even, the state has even done studies, which the Air Resources Board has published, and they just decided, oh, no, 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 that's, that's not good. So California won't even show to the world what the greenhouse gas emissions are from logging in the state. And what we know is that there's 30,000 acres at least that are still getting clear cut every year. Now, a lot of this is young forest. A, a real problem with California's forestry is short rotation, clear cutting. Okay, some of the biggest operators continue to clear cut forests when they're just barely beginning to recover. So the science on redwoods, for instance, is that a redwood doesn't even really begin to sequester carbon until the tree is, say, 70 or even more so 100 years old. And that the one thing 
about the Redwoods is that they continue to sequester more and more and more carbon the older they get. So not only was it a tragedy in the amount of carbon that was released when they logged the old forest, all that foregone sequestration is gone, the, the, the power. Um, which, which is a counter a little bit that I said earlier about like old trees, they get to a point where they're not pulling quite in the, down as much carbon. Um, young forests, it's known, it's, they just pull down tons, but the old trees have been, uh, you know, for a long time you might have heard about, you, you know, kind of like old decrepit forests. You know, the industry would talk about how an old forest was no longer productive because it wasn't, wasn't growing quite as fast as the young forest. But what we know, like with the redwoods, is that the, once the trees are like 100 years old, that's when they actually start to sequester carbon. So this is a Green Diamond Resources land, ex Simpson, in Humboldt County. Um, could you, could you, yep. There's two statements. In, could you just go back? You said the young ones are climbing down. Yeah, okay, so what will happen is if you have a whole forest of young trees, let's say by acre, the amount of carbon sequestration there, like, like the flow on an annual basis, it will be much greater than the annual amount of flow of sequestration in an old redwood forest. And can you define old, like? Thousand years plus. So about 100, between 100 and 1,000 is when you're and that's when that's when the capacity starts to really expand. Yeah. That's considered young. Say that again. That's considered a young forest. A hundred a younger than a hundred years old should definitely be considered a young forest. And is the sequestration in the plant itself or in the soil? Both. Great distinction. And that's yeah. I, and that's where you know don't um, you know don't forget about the forest for the trees, right? Because that's that's a, you know old you know old forest soils were incredibly dense uh, and really rich. But are young, young forests and old forests are sequestering in the soil and in their physical presence. I would I would say so. Yeah, definitely. Similar amounts, more or less. I mean, so then the other thing that we want to bring up around all this talk about carbon is is it's widely understood that if we're trying to measure carbon in in ecosystems like forests is that the very best of it is a statistical estimation that can be off by plus or 60 percent okay so um you know i i want to be careful but yeah, say that six oh percent or 16. six oh it's it's really i mean it's a really broad range and and all you can do is is make you know certain estimations Okay. That doesn't mean measuring carbon isn't an important metric, but it does expose further this fraudulent comparison between fossil fuel carbon and forest carbon. So when they talk one ton for one ton, you know, you really start getting in there and there's a lot of funky carbon accounting going on. In, in the California, uh, well, in the, the Air Resources Board, California Air Resources, Resources Board, U.S. domestic forest protocol for offsets. There's some funny accounting in it that I don't want to get into. So um, logging is, is happening really aggressively in the state and just now in the legislature because of the hysteria around fire that Governor Brown greased the skids. The leg legislature passed a, a, a loosening of logging restrictions so that uh, a landowner of up to 300 acres can now log on their land any tree up to 32 inches diameter, which includes a lot of 100-year-old trees, and can build roads as long as a half mile long without even getting environmental review. Wow. And this is in a state where getting a timber harvest plan approved is not a problem. I can tell you because Cal Fire has said legally in the state of California, global climate leader, that carbon sequestration with logging operations is not a legal consideration. Okay, so the state still has not even made the jump to make sure that legally that we estimate the emissions from logging and, and uh, accordingly adapt any logging plans to ensure that there's not carbon loss on the, on the landscape. So there's no focus in those new laws regarding diseased or dying trees compared to healthy trees? 
Well, the, so there's a couple of, of also sort of myths. First thing, remember a dying tree in an old forest in California, like in the old redwood forest, the ancient forest, up to one third of the standing trees would be dead standing trees. So this idea that having a dead standing tree, somehow it's bad for the forest, is a timber industry myth that's been pushed by the media and people will start to adopt it. Okay, the, you know, it's, a dead standing tree is what we call wildlife habitat. It's, it, you know, and so there. What about the millions of trees in the Sierra? So there, so the, we start going really, really deep on the science, and I, I think there could be some real questions about. So what's happening with climate change? Is it true that the winters are warmer, so that the beetles are not being uh, restrained by the cold, and they're being more aggressive? But now there's all sorts of stuff coming from studies in Montana looking at disturbance regimes like bugs, like fire, and all the rest for us to understand that what the forest may be doing with these major conflagrations and things is actually trying to adapt to climate change. It's not that the forest is necessarily just dying from climate change, which in some instances there are some really you know, changes going on, but the point I really want to make with this though is that if our forests are under that much stress from climate change, and which I believe is needs to be considered, why are we logging so many green trees? If having dead trees is such a concern, why are we logging the big living trees? So there's a lot of incongruencies with, with what the state is saying. And so this is Scotia in Humboldt County. And you know, like you're saying, you know, people are worried about dead trees and everything, but this is they, all these logs are are green trees. All this lumber, okay, this is where the real question is for how California is moving forward with addressing forests and climate because California's uh, big forest carbon plan that they release puts a strong focus on what they call the harvested wood product carbon sink. So that the state of California, if, if we win, to the Governor's Climate Forest Task Force and said, well, hey, everyone with your tropical forest, just so you know, California thinks that lumber has a special environmental benefit, you would freak out. But that's the concern about the offset schemes, is that their calculation of the carbon accounting allows for the lumber afterwards to be considered sequestered carbon. The, the harvested wood product carbon sink. And it's, it's uh, something that the timber industry has promoted around the world. So are you saying, just so we know, that harvested wood products have no carbon in them? It's a, they, they have lots of carbon in them, them, but it's a delayed emission. It's, it's not, there's no permanence. If they're used for a building or whatever. Let's try this one. So we know now that California is importing oil that is coming from the Western Amazon, and that includes oil coming now from under Yasuni, one of the most important remaining protected areas on the planet. We know that oil then comes in to California and is refined in refineries in California, which are regulated under the cap and trade program. As a matter of fact, the carbon market is the sole mechanism for regulating greenhouse gases from sources like refineries. That's a whole different thing to get into about the air district and, and what's that. So now, then Chevron, who brings that oil in to refine it in El Segundo and Richmond, participates in cap and trade, and what they do is buy forest offsets. And so then that forest offset says, well, this harvested wood product counts as the sequestered carbon. Tell me that the carbon from Yasuni is equal to that 2 by 4 that's what the state wants to make you think. That's what cap and trade wants to make you think. And it, it's, a, it's a scientific hoax that's being perpetuated. And, and with this global uh, climate action summit, they're getting way, I mean, that's the big thing. Paris is all about market mechanisms. That's, they're gonna celebrate market, market mechanisms here. So it's, it's um, you know, and, and what's going on then is that the other thing that isn't getting any attention is that this company, Humboldt Redwoods Company, which is a company that um, 
acquired the Pacific Lumber Company in 2008. Anyone here remember Charles Hurwitz and Maxam and, and the war with and the Redwoods and everything? So Palco, after clear cutting the hell, you know, sit between 1986 and 2008, some 70,000 acres of old growth redwood forest was lost. And then Humboldt Redwoods Company acquired the holdings. Humboldt Redwoods Company is a sister company to Mendocino Redwood Company that in 1998 had acquired Louisiana Pacific lands. So these two companies belong to the Fisher family. So we're talking about really serious aristocratic California money. Fisher family owns the Gap, they own Old Navy, they own Banana Republic, they own 500,000 acres of the most productive redwood timberland in the state. The chief financial officer of the Gap for many years was a woman named Ann Goost. Does anyone here know who Ann Goost is? Uh, Brown's wife. Brown's wife. Okay. Humble Redwood Company is pushing really hard to log the remaining old growth forest in the headwaters of the Matoll River. This is in 2018. So California is going to tell the world that we're going to do something about forests. We're going to save tropical forests and they can't even stop logging old growth here in the state. So these folks are going to be around this week. They were out in the march yesterday. So there's a whole crew of folks that came down from the Mentola in here. And there's a question over here. I'm just wondering, I mean, I, I guess I'm just wondering that you Yeah, without, without, I mean, I, I think it's a very fascinating topic, and, you know, I, I just think in the context of what's going to let me get to the finish of this, sure. and I think there's, uh, you know, what happens is that when we talk about the market mechanisms that rely on programs like cap and trade, is that all the focus suddenly is on this wonderful thing that's happening in the forest, in this watershed. But EcoJust is not, they're not, it's not happening. If they're not, I mean, there's, there's lots of different mechanisms that can, can be, be used, but one thing that we've also discovered at this point in time is that the traditional ways of perhaps the state government or even the federal government stepping up to be the conservator of lands has been kind of tossed aside. Because it's all about, we're talking about the normalization of the privatization of the conservation of nature. Now, I've worked in private conservation initiatives before, and I was very involved, for instance, um, in southern Chile, around a lot of the efforts with, uh, um, you know, Conservación Patagónica, I was very much part of the Patagonia Senior Red Press campaign, and so, and I've, and, and I've worked in many instances. I understand the importance of private actors being able to, cons to conserve, so I don't want to just dismiss it out of hand by any means whatsoever in, in this talk. Um, but I think it's a big question that perhaps other folks as well can contribute to. Um, and it will be a big question this whole week, the role of private investors or not, or what's being achieved with it. I think the other question always is the public relations twist to it. Who, who is using it for their branding, for what purpose? So, um, but, you know, I, and not being that familiar with uh, the recent activities of Equal Trust, I, I wouldn't be able to. Yeah. I would encourage you to familiarize yourself so the, so the mechanism is really key but if someone's trying to sell offsets to an airline they're they're just contributing to climate science the literacy you know so that, I mean but there's, there's different there's different things we can we're just to rapidly kind of finish here though too, uh, with the fires that are happening, so there's a lot of focus on fires and people talk about how climate um, is affecting fire. The, the one thing to remember is these fires are not igniting because of climate change, okay? These, these fires are not just spontaneously combusting. It was PG&E that let the, state on, let, like, lit the state on fire last year 
And a lot of the work, there's this Delta fires burning right now near Reading, and this was clearly from a vehicle accident. Again, so a lot of the worst fires this summer have all been ignited by, by, by vehicle to vehicle accidents and such. And the other thing that's not really mentioned enough is how much having a landscape that's been heavily logged over and over again creates a very volatile landscape that is prone to very high severity fires. So this is a shot I took on Highway 101 and up north just at Hopland, the little funky mill that's there in Hopland. You can see the Mendocino complex fire. This is just like uh, maybe 16 hours after it had ignited. So fire is a really big issue in California. It's also our forests are fire evolved. Fire is what indigenous people use since time immemorial to, to, to manage and care for forests here. Um, so, you know, this idea as well then that a really volatile fire evolved landscape can provide the kind of stable repository for carbon that offsets suggest it would is, is also not really congruent with what's happening and the fact is is that there are offset projects that are literally going up in flames. So, you know, there's, that's a lot of pollution that's happening. Um, we need to learn how to live with fire in this state, um, which would require more fire, not less fire. There's a fire deficit on the landscape. The other thing to recognize, 16 of the last 17 really big fires here in the state didn't even happen in forested landscapes. So there's all this focus on thinning the forest. We've got to attack the forest, we've got to thin the forest, we've got to loosen environmental regulation so we can log more to deal with fire. But, um, you know, our, fo our forests need, need fire. Um, and then, I mean, just to c conclude again, um, you know, with some emphasis on on what's happening. So, you know, market mechanisms, a, a famous market mechanism that's been used around forests is the idea of forest certification. So the Forest Stewardship Council. These are FSC certified clear cuts. So Green Diamond got certified by FSC in 2013. And the process around that certification was really, uh, there was a charade around public participation. The community was totally disregarded and um, when you see an FSC, Mar I'm sorry to say, I've worked, the FSC is one of the things I most worked on through like from 1995 to say 2008 or so and everything. And I've just watched the FSC prioritize acreage over standards over, over the years. And so the funny thing was then, those who followed certification, Green Diamond was certified by SFI, the Sustainable Forestry Initiative and they were able to maintain their SFI certification and be certified by FSC at the same time. Um, and now all, all of these logs, the other thing that Green Diamond did when they certified, when we talk about you know, jobs and justice and um, just transition, um, there's no question that the timber industry collapsed and there were some kind of weak gestures towards helping the transition, but it, it didn't occur and um, you, you know, a, a lot of people have suffered immensely, uh, professionally and economically, because of the lack of a, of a transition. Green Diamond went ahead and they didn't tell the public that this was part of their business plan when they pursued their FSC certification. But after they got the FSC certification, they closed their last two remaining mills. Some 120 people out of work, and then all they do now is send their logs down to the Humble Redwood Company mill in Scotia, so that everything that comes out of that mill now can be can be labeled FSC. So anyone who's a Giants fan or a Warriors fan and you're watching the game, and, you know they they come on the real strong redwood thing. I mean, it's just a, it's just a, a marketing thing. So I think your question was re really good. I know other people have questions. I feel like I've said a, a lot. I I feel really respected and appreciate. The, the attention that the people have gave, and, and I'm welcome to answer some questions, but I think I would be, um, I would enjoy it if more people can, contributed, so it would, because I, you know, I had my chance, I think everyone else should too, so. Thanks for your attention.